We respectfully request the Sangha Great Virtues for the sake of this assembly and all living beings. Please turn the wonderful Dharma will to teach and guide us how to end birth and death, leave suffering and attain bliss, and quickly realize non-birth. Thương thân đại đức tặng thân vì thứ pháp hội cập nhật thi hết chúng sanh tịnh duyên diệu pháp luân giao đạo ngã môn như há liệu sanh thoát tư ly khổ đạt là tất chứng vô sanh Hamas the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one Namo sananto sucedo ye ala hodi san miao san puto xie Namo tanakta to ya da ya la de tam nu tam bo da to The unsurpassed, profound, subtle, and wonderful Dharma in a hundred thousand million aeons is difficult to encounter. Now that I'm able to see and hear, I will receive and maintain it. I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual principles. Wu sheng 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 wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan zao yu wo jin jie wen de shou chu yuan jie ru lai zheng shi yi O Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Great Master Hui Nang, Great Master Shen Hua, all good monks and nuns and all good knowing advisors, Ami Tofo. Chu Fo Pu Sa Liu Zu Shi Fu Shang Ren, Ge Wei Chu Cha Ren, Ge Wei Shang Chi Shi, Ami Tofo. Chi Phật Bồ Tát, Ngân Thư Lục Tổ, Ở Thượng Thiện Hóa, Quý Thầy Cô, Cả Phí Vị Và Quý Vị Thịnh, Chi Thức Cả Như Đạo Phật. Hello, everyone. Today is the 29th of April, 2023. We're here, back here at Wei Mountain Temple to continue discussing Chapter 4 of the Six Patriarch Sutra. Um, we are currently on slide 67. Hmm, let's jump right into it. He's talking about concentration and wisdom. So he gives us... us uh, um, he talks about different levels of concentration and wisdom as well, okay? Unfortunately, it's not as clearly delineated, but the, like most Chinese masters, when they explain the sutra, when it comes to this section, I read a few of the Chinese explanations, including Master Xinhua's. They don't quite go into the details. And so to me, uh, when I first learned the sutra from the Chinese uh, masters and the Chinese bay chart, a little bit confusing. So I tried uh, to undo that for you, okay? Uh, the last time we, for the first pass, first time we explained this, chapter four, maybe four or five years ago, uh, didn't do a good job. So today I will make amends and, uh, and uh, explain a little bit more for you. Be more specific of you are. Sutra text. If you merely do not think of a hundred things and so completely rid yourself of thought, then as the last thought, the last thought ceases, you die and undergo rebirth in another place. Okay. So he says, 
on the commentary slide 68. He says, you don't think of the miscellaneous things, okay? And so therefore, your mind is free of thoughts. You get rid of thoughts in your mind, okay? However, however, uh, at the end of your life, when your last thought ceases, you will die, and then you will undergo for rebirth in another place. Okay, what he's referring to, uh, uh, let me, let's go through uh, the next couple of slides here so that we have the, the, get the full message instead of jumping in too soon, through prematurely. 69, that is a mistake of which students of the way should take heed. Okay, so it says, don't make the mistake. If you cultivate, this is very important, okay? Uh, many students of the way, especially, just for your information, especially people who have a little bit of Kung Fu, okay? I'm talking about a lot of teachers out there make this mistake, especially non-Buddhist teachers, uh, okay? Uh, so what is he talking about? He's talking about He's referring to a state of meditation chant skills where you are able to have put an end to your, your thoughts. Okay? You stop thinking of the hundred things, meaning that you don't think anymore. You don't think about much at all. So when you meditate, okay, you can sit there and you really... Your mind is blank. It has no thoughts. Is it clear? It's possible. It's not a high level at all. It doesn't take much to get there, by the way. Usually in the past, my students would take about three years to get there. Now, uh, the last ones got there in like weeks. <laughs> Scary nowadays. You guys are incredible. My first students, they could not cross their legs. Uh, you tell them to endure pain, they say, no, man, so it's too much. Uh, and they whine constantly, and they say, this is too hard. And so for years, I have to put up with them not being able to cross in full lotus. Or they say, Master, I don't meditate. Take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Not a male come uh, Chan master nowadays. He can say, "I can take it. I can take it. I hate it. I can take it." <laughs> we, we, my, in, in my first generation disciple, they said, oh, "This is too much. This is not American. Okay, uh, this is inhuman." Mm. So anyway, mm. so that's why nowadays uh, uh, the the uh, the some of the students can be so fast because because. Because it all it takes is for you to endure, to get to this stage, okay? Where your head is so light and so free of thoughts. Hmm? Meaning that you can sit there and you feel, feel so blissful, so free. Okay? Very happy state. And that's why, that's why he says here, you don't think of a hundred things. You're not attached. You, you're free of so many attachments. So in other words, you've, what you experience is what in Buddhism or in meditation, they, they mention this concept of emptiness. You're free of thoughts. That's emptiness. Okay? So you experience this level of emptiness. Specifically, uh, when he, what he's referring to? He's referring to Fourth dhyana and up. Okay, so for example, again, this morning I used example of the lady in, in purple back there, or pink. Is it pink but purple? I cannot tell. Uh, getting older, my eyesight is not that good anymore. Lavender. lavender, oh, thank you. See, I know it's not pink nor purple. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, lavender. Okay, the lavender lady. Okay. She's a second stage ahat, so it's, she's way past this, this level, okay? She doesn't know it. She's just that, you know, 
She just said like, okay, now what? <laughs> now what? I'm, I'm so free and peaceful, and then what? It's nice. But when her last thought ceases, at her time of death, when that time comes, okay, uh, before she dies, she will have the last, one last thought, and then she'll go for rebirth. Even at her level, she will have to go to rebirth, let alone these people. At low level, especially the non-Buddhist practitioners or the Buddhist monks and nuns who are not trained properly, who don't have the proper foundation, who weren't told about this by the teachers, ill-prepared by the teachers. Thank you very much. Okay, she's beyond that too, by the way. Anyway, uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, my tea server. <laughs> anyway, uh, dime a dozen such people. Anyway, uh, so, so, so what happened? She's referring to uh, the fourth dhyana practitioners. They, they meditate, and when they meditate at the time of death, they one have one last thought. Okay, I'm dying. Goodbye, world. Anyone? Sounds familiar? Goodbye, world. Goodbye, uh, goodbye, honey. I love you. Okay, forever. <laughs> Sounds familiar? Huh? You drop everything except for the last thought. I love you, honey. I hate to go, but <laughs> hey, <laughs> we meet again. Sayonara. Adios. Okay. Hasta luego. Whatever. Okay. Uh, so, because the attachment's there, because you attach to the person you love. That's usually why you have to have a last thought. People don't realize. You can sit there and say, hmm, I'm so happy. And then when, they're, when, they, when they, the, the time for them to go, still one last thought arises and says, I love my wife. Oh, love is so beautiful. <laughs> or the Catholic, what would they have the last thought be? God, I'm coming. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> okay? Uh, so, uh, that one thought right there is your heaviest attachment. They don't realize. See, I'm giving you the details that's not filled out here. But the master, Hui Neng, he's so precise. He says, I'm warning you, I'm cautioning you, meditation practitioner, you know, people who, who have practicing a spiritual path. Don't think just because you have no thoughts is kind of cool, special. Not yet, because you don't realize at the time of death, there's one more th last thought that will arise. Be careful. Okay, I'm spelling it out for you. What about Mr. Buffet? When he dies, what he's going to think of? What's going to happen to my fortune? <laughs> huh? You see that? You, we all have this heavy attachment. Think about it. Look at yourself. For the lady in Lavendor, what would be, what do you think her last thought would be? She said, Gosh, I wish my two boys are monks. <laughs> then my life would be complete. <laughs> okay, you see? Uh, watch out. In all of us, we have this attachment. Hmm? My last thought would be, Oh, my beloved disciples, what's going to happen to you? <laughs> <laughs> I know that already. <laughs> okay, and then because of last thought, you get reborn in the heavens. Usually. <laughs> Depends on the thought. Okay, so far so good. Uh, and he says, it's a grave mistake. Don't make this mistake. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Master. Your last thought would be? <laughs> what if that's Would you like to say your last thought would be? <laughs> oh, mommy, mommy, where are thou? 
my question is, uh, what if our, the last thought is not our, but it's popped in our head? From what? The last thought is not our, but it's popped up. Depends on your level. He's referred to these people here who meditate, and then they, they get the level like a fourth yana and a little bit higher, higher. They realize that the, the mind becomes blank. They experience emptiness. The, th- the mind is empty of thoughts. And the thing is cool. They say, ah, I made it, I made it. Well, for us, we don't stop there. We say, ah, it's temporary. Because we still know we're still attached to mommy. <laughs> you see? To our beloved husband. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? Our daughters, maybe? Oh. <laughs> Who's going to take care of my daughter now? Who's going to protect her? <laughs> you got that? Huh? And Chung Yin, Sunim, what do you think his last thought would be? San Francisco, San Francisco. <laughs> And Malcolm's last thought? I love Koreans. <laughs> he doesn't realize this is weakness. <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, 71. To misinterpret the Dharma and make a mistake to yourself might be acceptable. But you will, in turn, advise others to do the same. Mm, 72. This is very, very serious here. Okay? Uh, uh, the six-page track says, if you misinterpret the Dharma, meaning what? You think you have no thought, and therefore you think you are a sage. Because the Buddha Sutra says, you, when you have no thought, you are you're sage, you have no thoughts. But it's not what it means. Different kinds of no thought levels. That's why it's very dangerous. So you misinterpret and think yourself as special, have having no thought, therefore you have some wisdom. Uh, it's a mistake that only affects you, yourself, it's okay. You survive because you're special already. You're high level enough already. Okay? And therefore, you won't suffer. You go to ascend to the heaven, you come down, you continue your cultivation. That's fine. Okay? However, the bigger problem for you are going to have is not so much about yourself. The biggest problem you have is that because you have some skills, you start teaching others, your students in particular, and you advise others and lead them in the same pathways. And therefore, your mistakes are amplified by the number of your disciples. I see this in the, especially the many teachers, Buddhists as well as non-Buddhists. Okay? I keep on being uh, reminded of uh, a certain teacher out there from India. Is Murali is he here today? How come I keep on thinking about Indian people? <laughs> okay, uh, so, you know, th- there is this, you know, like Ama or something. Anyone knows of Ama, the Indian spiritual leader, where she is very famous in India. She has a lot of disciples, and she's kind of overweight, but. She, her claim to fame is that she hugs everyone. Ama, I recommend it. You want some nice spiritual experience? Go to India and hug her. <laughs> yes, eight. You are right, Master. Her name is um, Ama, and she's uh, an Indian Hindu spirit- spiritual leader, guru, and humanitarian. Yes, he's a guru, and she's very famous because the visitors to her temple would line up to come to see her, 
And then what she does is, oh, whatever she says, I don't know exactly, but I'm told by a lot of people that she would hug you. And when she does that, you feel like, like a burst of energy as if you've been charged up. And that's why everyone walks away so impressed because, my God, Amma just make me feel so good. Oh, look at our Pure Land Express boys. <laughs> okay? Yeah. I hope you go to India and experience yourselves. Okay? <laughs> so anyway, so, so a lot of people I was so impressed by that, and it came back to me and said, Master, I'd like to become, i like to be, you know, i like to be like Ama one of these days, and be a spiritual leader, and then teach people, and, 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 uh, and uh, change them, uh, improve their lives. And this is exactly what the problem, exactly what the problem is with such spiritual teachers like Ama. Okay? Uh, her students will be stuck like hers if not lower levels than hers, okay? So that's a big issue. So, and, and the problem is that if you infect others with your erroneous views, and others will be stuck as well, so your mistake yep, is much more amplified, okay? Your rep re the repercussions are much more severe than you think. You spread the disease, if you will. So what to do? In Buddhism, we don't teach until our teacher tells us to. Not just any teacher, our enlightened teachers tell us to teach, then we teach. Otherwise, don't teach prematurely. It's very clear in, 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 in my world, in our world, in the Mahayana world, Okay, we f obey or follow the instructions of a sage, of a, a person who has wisdom, because we don't have any wisdom. So we don't do anything until someone wiser than us tells us. We place our faith on sages instead of trusting ourselves only. That's the difference between people who are in the know versus people who are full of themselves. Like in my last trip to Korea, I met with this uh, nun here who has a PhD from Harvard, Buddhology, Buddhist studies, Indian studies, whatever. So she's been teaching at the Korean University for 15, 20 years. She's been a nun for 50 years. Everyone is scared of her. He walks around and says, hey, I'm the most senior. I mean, I'm senior than most of you. Make way. Zou kai. In Chinese, you know, zou kai. Get out of my way. Okay? And I look at her. So, you know, the other Korean nuns are kind of terrified of her. Like, you know, you're the senior person and so forth. You, know, you have credentials and so forth. Look at her. I say, you want to join us? Seriously? We have no room for people like you. Why not? You're too stupid. It's not a problem you're stupid. Stupid is not a problem for me. The problem with me is that you're stupid and think you're smart. <laughs> That's my problem. And then you spread the disease. You go around, you get certified by a bunch of professors who don't know Buddhism at all. And then you, they certify you as an expert in Buddhism, and then they give you the credentials to go and teach. You spread the disease. It's okay for lay people to do that, but for us monks and nuns, why, that's a very serious offense to me. Very serious offense. It's okay for me. If you're a professor of Buddhology, of Eastern philosophy, and go teach, make a living, totally understand. Okay? That's our system. Our civilization, we, it's okay with us. Okay? Worldly knowledge. I call that kind of knowledge worldly knowledge. Even though it's knowledge about Buddhism, it's still worldly to us. No wisdom yet. They know words. They don't know the substance of the words. 
They don't know the true meaning of the words. So it's okay. You want to teach uh, words? Go ahead. You got certified to teach words? No problems with me. But you as a monk and nun, to go around and spread this disease here, okay? According to the six-page chart here, I have a huge issue with that. So I, I, I yelled at her. I said, you know, I was just, uh, just read the six-page chart sutra. And before I, I talked to you, I was preparing for my lecture. <laughs> I said, he was talking about you. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> and she was so upset. She said, what? You even have low, uh, uh, less Dharma age than me. I'm more, I've been a monk longer than you've been a monk. How dare you talk to me like that? And she was upset. And it's probably the first time in her life that a monk would dare yell at her like that. But her level is too low, so, yeah. She couldn't do anything. But anyway, so, so much for recruiting effort in Korea. <laughs> for some reason, you know, I keep on turning down all these nuns who have PhDs. She's not the first one. You know, they fool themselves. They think they know. And that's my problem with them. But that's the first time I yelled at someone. Maybe Korean tea. Uh, Cheers. <laughs> Give you too much energy, so I have to spend it. Anyway, next, 73. In your own confusion, you do not see, and moreover, you slander the Buddha's sutras. Therefore, no thought is established as a doctrine. 自迷不见,又谤佛经,所以立无念为宗. Okay, so it continues. So don't try to understand too much. This message here is not, it, we split it up because of limitation of this uh, space here. But it continues, the thought continues. He says, okay, uh, he says to complete the last thought. He says, if you spread the disease, you really don't understand sutras. That's why the Sikh Patriarch says, you don't understand sutras, and you claim you understand sutras, that to me is equivalent to slandering the Buddha sutras. It's very, very serious offense. And the Sikh Patriarch was upset, trust me. This is Chinese version of upset. For us, is we, you know, we curse or something. Okay, but this is Chinese being upset. A sage, Chinese sage being upset. He says, you! Slander Buddha Sutra, do you know that? <laughs> so lame, the Chinese. Anyway, we are a lot more emotional, you know, real. Okay? And therefore, for that reason, I'm establishing no thought as a doctrine in my school for my followers. And he'll elaborate what it means. Okay? So don't ask me, what do you mean I hear? Yes, go for us. I hope he's no, not asking me that. Uh, Chinese person, go ahead. Uh, Master, um, you have to put a number on the board. Put the numbers on the board. Also? It's not five, right? Yeah, it's not five. You said not five. I had only, I improved a little bit to last night. I slept for half an hour. I was hungry the whole night. I'm from, I just came back from Korea, so my, you know, I have jet lag. My timing is all messed up. Couldn't sleep. No matter what I tried. Too many thoughts. <laughs> So finally, around 7.30 or so, I doze off for half an hour. Hello? Yes. Hello? Chinese Sorry, person. About the technical difficulties. Um, Sorry, Master. Uh, could you spell out what is uh, Master Hui Nen so upset about this pre previous paragraph? It's a little bit hard to get it. 
is what I was accept when you mean about uh, that Korean nun professor uh, in the sutra in the sutra so the the whole part about um, don't think about um, all the thoughts die and then they still reborn to the other place uh, what is the master Hui nun's point the point is that uh, just because you have no thoughts doesn't mean you have wisdom uh, so he, he was trying to talk. So this paragraph is about Wu Nian Wei Zhong. So is this uh, different from the Wu Nian that he's explaining as the principle? He's explaining no thought there is a temporary state before you get to really a no thought doctrine that he's talking about. It's no thought temporarily until the last thought when before you die, which where, where, where your heaviest attachment will be, will arise. Right now you have no thought, but when you die, your heaviest attachment will come to the fore and produce that thought about your loved ones in particular. The things you love most, that will be your last thought will pop up in your last thought. So, so is the point that uh, we shouldn't be uh, prematurely think we are at the state of no thought without being verified by the teachers? That's right. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, so he says, because I know this mistake that you would tend to make, I'm reminding you that our Chan school is about no thought. Our doctrine is no thought. Okay? Is still there a question and go for us? Or you did not turn off the sign? Okay, I will have no thought about that. <clears throat> Next, 75. Good knowing advisors, why is no thought established as a doctrine? Because there are confused people who speak of seeing their own nature, and yet they produce a thought with regard to states. Okay, next, he says, okay, I warn you about the people who have no teachers who all have entered samadhi when no thought arises. It's temporary by nature. But by the time you die, they die, the thoughts of love and heavy attachment will arise. And that's why they will have to be reborn. They will still revolve in real reincarnation. I just told you about that already. Next. Yes, sir, seven. Uh, Master, did the people that had, they thought they had no thoughts, were, was it really like minute thoughts, and then they went out to go teach and spread the disease? Yeah, because then, because those people who meditate, when they meditate, they can enter this no thought samadhi, where no thought arises. So they said, wow, I must be a sage, because I have no thoughts. And they go around and say, hey, I'm a sage. Would you like to learn how to be like me? Let me teach you. That's what he's talking about. Okay? They are, really are sincere. Those, te those people are sincere. They're trying to help. Amma is a good person. She really wants to help. She's stupid enough to go and hug you every single one of you. She doesn't know that it's uh, not a healthy thing for her to do. That's why she's getting fatter and fatter and fatter. The way is a sign of disease, by the way. The more weight you gain, the more disease. So the more she hugs people. <laughs> yes, seven. So related to that question, if they went out to go teach, then they claim to be a sage or claim to be enlightened, and then that's a really, a real serious offense. It's a very serious offense. And it's slandering, slandering sutras, Buddhist sutras, because that's what Buddhist sutras you're referring to. The twisting. The Buddha's words, without knowing it. They really are sincere. They're trying to help, really, but they don't realize they are twisting the Buddha's word. 
That's what he means by slandering the sutras. Okay? Without intending to slander sutras. Still, it's very serious offense. Okay? So he says, okay, never mind all those people. How about us? What about the non-thought doctrine that we're talking about in our school? Okay? He says, in our side, the people who are Buddhists, who follow teachers, okay, who study with the patriarchs even, like me, he says. Uh, they learn about seeing the nature in our Chan school. Uh, and yet, and yet, they claim that they're students of Chan, they know about Chan, they read a lot of Chan books, well researched about Chan. Okay, so they can talk about, hey, Chan is about seeing your nature. That's what we do in our Chan practice. But while they talk up a good, good talk, good game, inside they still think when they're faced with states. Meaning what? They still think. What is it? I don't know about you, but me, uh, last day before I left Korea, after four weeks, for the first time, I saw a red Ferrari parked near the temple. <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> I said, wow, <laughs> what a nice car. You know what I mean? That's what it means. You produce thought with regard to state. I love red cars. I admit. So when I saw a red car, I said, wow, what a nice car. That is what he's referring to. Do we all have our attachments? Yes? What I call vices. When I talk to a monk or nun, I try to find out. They, they all, when I interview them, they say, would you like, they'd like to come and join us. I say, so how are you? They talk, about, they talk about how great they are, how great the teachers are, and what they fail to understand. I'm revealing my secret now, secret interview uh, method. Would you like to know? I'd like to hear about their vices, not their good stuff. I like them to tell me they like pizza with honey, like Koreans do. Disgusting thing. <laughs> Let me tell you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I never could get used to eating pizza with honey. Seriously? <laughs> with all due respect, I love my Korean disciples, but I can't swallow that. Or their burgers are sweet. <laughs> Koreans have sweet tooth or something. You know, honey with pizza, sweet hamburgers. For us, hamburgers are supposed to be salty and fatty. <laughs> okay? <laughs> anyway, I has not got distracted, okay? So, see, so that's my problem too, not the red car. Well, I look, you know, and not, no, not only red car, it's the pizza. And then I always, when they give me pizza, I say, is it going to be sweet or salty? <laughs> so, as soon as I eat pizza, I say, are you going to give me honey now? <laughs> you see, that's what he's referring to, produce thought. State is that whenever you see something, Okay? You react to it. That's what it's referring to. Produce thought is to react to it. Okay? How about most of you? How do you what do you react to? Billy, for example. You, what do you think he reacts to? No, no, we're not asking him. We're asking the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> what what do you react to, Billy? 
What pisses you off? Master, I have... Master? I have Excuse me? <laughs> what I'm reacting to is welcome back, Master. Welcome back. Welcome back. It's just... uh, he's <laughs> so insincere. <laughs> Uh, yeah? Yes, Malcolm. Billy reacts to Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut. He works, <laughs> he works at Pizza Hut, that's right. <laughs> yes, JC. Is it here? Oh, yeah, yeah, back there, <laughs> behind the pillar. Yeah. JC, we're waiting for you. Shall we ignore you? Okay, never mind. Okay, so produce thoughts with regard to states here, meaning you react to external stimuli. You see something, you hear something, you know. Are you talking to me? Okay. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. 77. Their thoughts cause deviant views to arise, and because of all defilement, because of that, all defilements and false thinking are produced. Seventy-eight. This is very important. You don't understand, you don't realize as soon as a thought arises, any thought arises, okay, uh, Deviant views will form inside of your mind. Deviant views, meaning you have prejudices, they are wrong. You have beliefs, you have understanding that you so believe, is so logical to you, they actually are wrong. And you don't realize it. That's why it's so dangerous. And because of that, those deviant views, defilement and false thinking are produced. You keep on thinking and you keep on creating more attachments. Okay? So for example, for me, I'm attached to salty and fatty burgers. Okay? Does it stop there? No. Then I would like my fries to be piping hot and lots of, of ketchup. That's when I eat sweet. <laughs> you see, it, you add to it. You add to one attachment and you add. It doesn't go, it doesn't stop there. It's like a, it snowballs. You add more and more and more. That's the nature of our deviant views. Our greed, it doesn't stop there. It snowballs. <laughs> That's what happens to us. The antidote, you cross your legs, you meditate, actually it reverses that. It shrinks the snowball, stops, slows it down, and then it reverses, undoes the build-up. Don't tell people. Okay? Yeah, cool? The reason that the six-page chart can describe this in this level of details because he knows how to undo it. And that's, I just summarized for you, 
practice chan, the chan practice undoes it naturally. Bit by bit by bit by bit. It's measured by your level of samadhi. If you improve, in the, it reverses the process more. And do more, it reverses more and more and more as your concentration power increases. All right? If you didn't practice chant, it builds up and up and bigger and bigger. That's what happens to all of us, not just you, me too. And don't ask me about Taiwanese food. I have my own attachment besides pizza and burgers. <laughs> Went to Taipei, Hong Shao Mian. I look for Hong Shao Mian. Okay? Anyway, you non Chinese people, I'm not going to talk. I don't bother talking to you. Ah, it's better noodle soup. Yeah. Yes, JC. No, JC. Sing your Johnny until your yours Seven. A uh, question from YouTube from Lyle. Amitafo, I was trying to ask from JC that a person who's confused like me to translate the Master Shenhua or Master Yonghua's sutras, su sutra lectures, would that be slandering the Buddha's sutra? Not at all. At your level, your translation is of value because it's not your views. It's your try. When you translate, try to translate the words. Don't add your commentaries. Don't interpret. Try to do your best, the best of your ability to translate the words only, Chinese words into Korean. That's it. No more, no less. That's all you have. Okay? What he's talking about here in Six Patriarch Sutra here, he's talking about those people who produce their own teachings. What we're we doing, if you don't have wisdom yet, then you want to stick with the sage's teachings, that you're not slandering the sutras. Anything else? Okay. You see how the Chinese, you know, they, what they talk about here is a lot more than I'm simplifying for you, okay, in a way that you can identify with. Uh, is that once you have one attachment of thought, you know, I love money, you know, and then then you say, I need to invest more in the real estate right now, okay? Or shall I wait until you know, two more years when the interest rate is a bit lower? But you know, when it's lower, then I have more competition for the, you know, the houses and the, the properties. So I might as well invest right now, right now. But if I invest right now, how can I convince my wife? It's a good thing to do. You know, see, thought after thought after thought after thought. That's why it snowballs. And that's how the Chinese put it. All right? Are we done with JC or still more questions from JC? Master, the JC sign is just stuck there. Just ignore it. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Repeat. I just, a question from JC. The image is just stuck there. It's just uh, we can ignore it. Okay, 79. Originally, not one single dharma can be obtained in self-nature. If there is something to attain or false talk of misfortune and blessing, that is just defilement and deviant views. Therefore, this Dhamma door establishes no thought as its doctrine. Okay, 
Okay. So he, furthermore, on commentary slide 80, we're going to be close to finishing this. Uh, I preparing it, and I was looking at it uh, after lunch today, just before the lecture, and it went up to 90. Slide number 90. So we're almost at the end. We have one more hour to go, so I better slow down. If not, <laughs> another attachment. <laughs> I have two hours. You know how much pressure that is every single weekend? <laughs> it's a make or break. Yeah. Okay, uh, so originally, or well, fundamentally, not originally, fundamentally, in fact, okay, the fact is, fundamentally, not a single dharma can, can be obtained in the self nature. Just memorize it. Just. Uh, because it's referring to the self-nature, which doesn't mean anything to you. Okay? So, if anyone tries to explain to you, like to you in particular, say, you know, it's not a single dharma can attain a self-nature. Let me tell you why. And you know, what do you do? You run. <laughs> okay? Run away. Because, because, because it's not something that can be explained to you. You have to experience it. He can only relate to you. He says, you know, oh, not a single thing can be obtained in the self-nature. That's all. If, 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 if you are enlightened, then you know what, what this means. You're not enlightened, there's no way to explain to you. Like Alex, a person like Alex, let me see if I can explain it to my, my, my child. Okay. Furthermore, he says, if there's something to attain, a false talk about misfortune and blessing, there's just defilement and deviant views. What is he referring to? If it were in the case, is if, you know, same thing when we teach you chant. I give an example. When we teach you chant, okay, uh, when you go to a place where you learn meditation, what do they talk to you about? What do they teach you? They teach you about, yeah, okay, I see what my, my deviant disciples uh, learn from, from those places, <laughs> yeah? Eight. I never went to any other meditation class, but I think I heard uh, searching, searching for happiness. Yeah, what is it? Searching for happiness, pursuit of happiness, okay? Uh, Yes, people talk about, you know, you practice Chan will make you happier and so forth. Uh, or, you know, on Sunday night, 11 o'clock, tune in to the mega church broadcast. Uh, Joel Oberstein or something. You deserve to be successful. You're special. Mwah! <laughs> okay? Uh, okay, because you're so special. You do this to be successful, you do this to be, uh, because you deserve it, okay? You're so special. All those are not real because, because you're seeking for success, you're seeking for happiness. It's not wisdom. It's nothing for sale. You are complete within yourself. You don't need anyone to make you feel better, richer, more successful. You don't need any diploma. Okay? You don't need, you don't need uh, your banker to tell you you have plenty of money in the bank. It's measured by blessings. It's not measured by money. Your wealth is really the real wealth is in the love, is, uh, is the blessings you have, not the money you count in the bank. Okay? So that's why to talk about success, to talk about material things and that you can gain from practicing Chan, practicing meditation, is not Buddhist Chan. It's sales pitch. And why, does, why did I talk about this this morning? I was selling to you. 
newcomers. <laughs> what are we going to do? Newcomers, you come and say, why am I doing this? It hurts like hell. So I have to explain to you, the little benefits you will get is so, so, and so. But it goes beyond that. It's not the only thing. But why are we doing this? Okay, additionally, you get some real benefits, concrete benefits, and then it gets much better and better and better, much bigger than just this. Whereas the other uh, approaches, the other uh, spiritual path, they only talk about success and love and, and you know, and, and uh, how special you are. Okay? The real, the real wisdom, the real success, the real achievement is no thought. You meditate. You practice until your mind produces no thought whatsoever when you encounter the state, including your death. When at the time of death, you know your time has come. That's when your heaviest attachment would pop up. The thought up from your heaviest attachment will arise naturally. Beware. Yes, in the back. Master, what happened to those of the four state are head and above when they pass away? What happened to those heavy attachments? Do they arise at the same time? And how does that differ from the ordinary beings lower than their state? Well, the difference, the difference with the four stage arhat and higher is that uh, they choose what to do next, whereas we cannot help ourselves. Okay? Meaning what? For us, as I said, for us, okay, for me personally, we're probably a red car. I said, God, my entire life, all I want is a red car. So my, you know, I wasted all this time and all these things. And it doesn't do anything for me. All I want is a nice red car I can drive. Okay? I've been saying this for 10 years now. No one pays attention to it. <laughs> you all pay attention to how to improve and have open your wisdom. But you miss out all this very important point. You really like me. <laughs> Think red car, <laughs> please. Okay? Uh, somebody, somebody said, Master, it's just a red car. I give you a helicopter. I said, no, 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 no. Don't give me a yacht. A yacht. <laughs> jet, Lear, jet, whatever. I don't care. I just want a red car for now first. <laughs> first, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk big to me. Give me a red car and then you see what I'm going to ask next. Yes, seven. Master, is it possible that the last thought could be from a hungry ghost that planted the thought inside you or a, a, credit, a past creditor? That too. That could happen too. Absolutely. For ordinary people like us. However, there's the question about the sages, four sage Rahat or higher, who have, who have uh, wisdom. And four sage Rahat, he says, I'm going to go to the heavens. I'm tired of living here. No one takes care of me. I spend my entire life helping her, helping her, helping him. And when I'm old, okay, I'm no longer useful to them. What? Guess what? They found another teacher. <laughs> okay? So why should I come back here in this world? I'm going to go to heavens and enjoy myself. That could happen. Okay? That happens in Fourth Age Ahad, by the way. Okay? He has wisdom. He says, I am not making this mistake again. These people are ungrateful. You know what I mean, Sien Shun? Ungratitude. Ingratitude. Well, he looks so innocent. Hmm. 
Okay? So the, the, the first day, Ezra said, enough of this. I'm going to go to heavens and then uh, work on my own cultivation and not bother with these people. Yes, four. Thank you, Master. <coughs> Sorry. What if your last thought is uh, Amitofo? What? What if your last thought is Amitofo? Well, you think all you want. People who are dying, all they want to do is go to the pure land. So their last thought and attachment is to oh. saying Amitofo over and over. Is that correct? Or are they mistaken? Yeah, well, that's more than that. And even after your last thought, and there's all, after the last thought during, there's a 49 day period where you're going to have, you'll be subject to a lot more disturbances and, and obstructions. It's not that simple. Okay? Uh, but however, for people like Alex, that would be the case, but people like a Forsei Jaha, he says, I'm going to the heavens. I have enough. Okay? You know? And, and, and I've seen, by the way, I've seen Forsei Jaha, so like in Vietnam, uh, they help a lot of people. They carry them on the back. And then, and then when they're sick, they have diabetes. And no one really, they don't, don't even have enough money to pay for their medication. Okay? It saddens me to see that. Uh, and they have wisdom, therefore, they say, okay, it's my body suffering, no big deal. Okay? They don't even ask for help. To me, it's pretty sad because of ungrateful disciples. You know what I mean? That to me, it makes me sad. Not that the force of Jahad is really suffering at all. I suffer because I see that. I say, my God, he spends the entire life helping you, helping you. In the end, you're so still confused that you don't know that he's old. He has no income. No one is looking after him. If you really got something out of him, you should inquire about his well-being before he leaves. It's the last, last, uh, the least decent thing that you should be doing. Okay? It bothers me. Anyway, but not for these four sages. Ah, okay, I'm out of here. I'm done. Okay? Uh, so uh, they have this thought where they go, they say, okay, let's go to the heavens. Or this particular monk, a Vietnamese monk in the secret school, he helped a lot of uh, ghosts and people fight ghosts and disease and so forth. Okay. And he says, I'm going back, I'm coming back as, as a human again to continue my work. That's his, was his last thought. He said, I'm coming back. I'm going nowhere. I'm, I'm, com I'm coming right back. Okay. And what happens to him is that when he does that, when he decides that, okay, he'll come right back. The 49-day period, he's exempt from that. Sages are exempt from the 49-day period. But people like us, we need to go through, after our last thought, we go through a 49-day period where we're going to be, the problems get worse than even the last thought. Okay? It's more, than you th more involved than you think. Anyway, so he, he decided to come back as a human being so that he continues his work. If that happens, he'll be born again as a boy, and then he grows up, encounter Buddhism again, practice again, become force heart again, and continue to do his work. That's his plan. Guess what? His disciples said, he talked to me and said, will you help him go to the Pure Land? <laughs> So I said, yes, I can. So he's in the pure land now. Okay, because we believe it's better for him to go to the pure land. So he's in the pure land. But occasionally he'll come back. <laughs> he'll go back and forth, back and forth. Like visits, he travels back and forth. 
to the people he cares for. Anyway, so, so, uh, so, but he cannot decide to go to the Pure Land himself. He can't go to the Pure Land. If he wants to go to the Pure Land, he can't. Not on his own power. He needs help. Whereas a Bodhisattva is totally different. For Sejahat is lower. Bodhisattva is way up here. Bodhisattva is special. They can go anywhere they wish. Okay, does it answer your question? It's very precise. Okay, going back to slide 80. Uh, so the school that Master Huineng is teaching is that fundamentally, it's no thought, all right? Mm -hmm. He further elaborates, 81, good knowing advisors, no means no what, thought means thought of what. All right. So he dissects it. No thought. What does it mean? No what? Thought what? Okay. 83. No means no two marks. No thought of defilement. Thought means thought of the original nature of true suchness. True suchness is a substance of thought, and thought is a function of true suchness. 无者无二相,无诸尘劳之心,念者念真如本性,真如即是念之体,念即是真如之用. Okay, again here, uh, the Chinese uh, teachers, they uh, really don't elaborate much. Okay, so the, what happens is a lot of uh, uh, scholars and readers, they read this, uh, they usually gloss over, they don't quite understand. Okay, uh, even Master Shi Hua didn't elaborate much on this. Uh, he says, Six Patriarch says, no means no two marks, no thought the defilements. Okay, uh, no two marks, what does it mean? The two marks here refers to the nature of existence, meaning that everything that exists in our world comes in a pair, male and female, black or white, good or bad. What else? It comes in pairs. Rich and poor. What? Daughter and son? Come on, continue. Yin and yang, very good. Gelato and pizza? Light and dark, very good. See, everything in our world, when you think about it, comes in pairs. If you think one, there's an opposite to it. Give me an example that has no opposites. Yes, eight. Master, why is it always, uh, it it's comes in pair? If that's the nature, that's how it's built. Why is that you have black hair when the Caucasian have yellow hair? That's how you built. You want, you want to become a blonde, you have to dye your hair. Yes. Didn't Shakyamuni Buddha uh, created this world? Did he made it that way or just it happened to be just that way? That's how the world is built. That's how you have balance. You need two opposing forces to have balance. Love and hate. Hmm? Just remember, 
You first fall in love, and then eventually you hate. <laughs> Why? It's funny? It's not true? Think about it. All right? So the nature of existence is that it's dual. It has two opposing forces to maintain balance, to start the squall. That's how it works in our world. That's how we built weak versus strong. So far, so good? That's Buddhist wisdom right there. Look, observe our world is dual. Everything has an opposite. Everything. Okay? So what does it mean, no? No duality. No duality means what? Suppose you're poor right now. You're poor, right? I mean, that's why you're here. Let's face it, you're rich, you wouldn't waste time being here. <laughs> well, it's funny. I don't think it's that funny. <laughs> it's so sad to me. I wish you all rich. <laughs> yes, go for us. Uh, I was going to answer that uh, no duality just means no uh, no discrimination. No what? Discrimination. No discrimination. That's correct. No thought defilement is that's discrimination. That's why I was still growing at. So, so, you see, I just proved to you. I look at you, I say, why are you so poor? <laughs> okay? So, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about no two marks. I look at you, I thought immediately of rich. But he said, oh, no, no, it's not going to happen. You see what I mean? That's right there, an example of, of no such thought. For me, the thought comes naturally. Why am I so poor? Why are we so poor? Why are they so poor? <laughs> Why can't rich people come? <laughs> It would be just as nice to have rich disciples. Yeah? See? The thought, the, the thought of, of poor versus rich. Pain versus pleasure. It would be so much more pleasant if you're rich and I'll have a nicer building. Huh? Have you thought about it? Do something about it, for God's sake. <laughs> It's just talk, talk, talk. All you guys do is talk, talk, talk. Okay? So, so that's what no means. We always think of pairs. We react in, 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 to duality, in a sense of duality. So far, so good? Thought means thought of the original nature of true suchness. What is he referring to? So no says, if you're mortals, mere mortals, ordinary people, you always are discriminating. You want rich, you want poor, you want pleasant, you want nice, you want, you want, you want to be liked. Respect me, like me. Okay? So why, why can't you be nice to me? What did I do to you? Okay? Uh, so that's what happened to no. What about thought? No here, you're describing a state of, for most of us, ordinary people, we discriminate. Okay? We, we, we have a preference. Some people prefer pleasure, some people prefer pain. Uh -huh. Okay, 
thought here refers to the original nature of true suchness. Meaning what? Very simple. The people who think they are enlightened, guess what? So they said, I've seen my nature. I think I'm enlightened. What does it mean? No, you're not. <laughs> because enlightenment is non-dual. Okay? The, 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 the true suchness is non-dual. No is still dual. It's two marks. Thought here, the true suchness here, meaning that it's only one. Called true suchness. Your Buddha nature is only one. It's not, it's nothing opposed to it. That one there includes everything, the oneness, totality, all of it, all the ball of wax, okay? Including emptiness, it has everything. You say, what about, it has everything, what about the opposite of it? There's no opposite. Everything is contained within it. Whatever you can think of is contained in it already. So far, so good. That's called true suchness. So people who practice like us, okay, who say, oh, I've been practicing American Chan. I think I'm enlightened. <laughs> I have no thoughts. I must be enlightened. Let's go ask master. <laughs> the master says, no, you're not, you idiot. <laughs> as long as you have a thought, I'm enlightened, you are not enlightened. You see that? He's, you're thinking of true suchness. I'm enlightened. I am true suchness. That's what he's referring to. You like? That's why he, he breaks it up. No is for mortals like us. Thought is for people who have a little bit of kung fu, who says, hey, I must be so cool already. I must be enlightened. Because enlightened people, see, there's nothing to talk about. Yes, Alex. Why are we doing this? So that we don't talk about anything. Exactly. Um, so I was thinking about... Hey, Alex, he wants to talk about something. Obviously. Uh, so I was thinking about yesterday's lecture. He's thinking. How... Look at that. He's thinking. Thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. I rest my case. Provisional, not profound. Um, and I was thinking about how the Buddha spoke in a universal way that allowed all people to hear and learn from him uh, about the profound nature of reality. And I was observing that when I listen to lecture, listen to my good knowing advisor, I always walk away happier because I'm just like, oh, it's changing me. Oh, I feel better. Oh, I can approach this in a better way. But then I was, after I heard that he spoke universally, that I was thinking that, oh, I shouldn't be listening to Dharma in any way that is that where I is listening or that Alex is listening to the Dharma, or it's changing Alex. It should only be affecting my consciousness in a way that allows it to transform completely away from that. Is that right? No. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Can you please expound? TNT. Thine, oh my. Same old, same old. But let's talk about that. Let's address it a little bit. He says, I listen to Dharma, I practice, I feel happy, it makes me happy. Yes? Is it reasonable? Of course, it's natural. You eat ice cream, you like it or not? You say, I eat ice cream, I'm not supposed to attach to this. You're fooling yourself. It's normal to enjoy it. You practice meditation, it hurts, and then after the hurt, you feel, have these special feelings you never experienced before. Guaranteed. 
all of you. It happened to me. The more it hurts, the more intense a good feeling after, by the way. Something you never experience unless you go through the gate of pain and discomfort. Okay? And so it's natural to enjoy. You know, if you look at, look at the sunset, it's enjoyable. Sunrise, it's fun. I enjoy going to museums. My gosh, we're talking about attachments. <laughs> Okay, there's nothing wrong with it, I think. That's why I talk about vices. And you, be, you impress me more by talking to me and say, I want to join you because I heard you travel a lot. <laughs> okay, heard you going to Europe next week. Are you stopping by? Are you going to France, the Louvre, huh? Huh? and so forth? Huh? Hey, eh, it's part of life. If you live, you have no vices. Why, why, are, why, do you, why are you here? Wait a minute. <laughs> we came here because there's some vices that are ingrained in our psyche. And you tell me you have no vices whatsoever? Then what are you still doing here? Seriously? Uh, so anyway. So for him... To practice and listen to Dharma, I said, wow, these are cool thoughts. These are things I would never think of myself before. This is enjoyable. This is beautiful. These thoughts are so beautiful. Yes? He, he loves the beautiful thoughts. And as soon as he loves the thoughts, he starts thinking. <laughs> Don't confuse the two. It's perfectly normal to enjoy the beauty of wisdom. Wisdom is beautiful. The more wisdom you have, the more you appreciate beauty, by the way. Wisdom is not something, oh, I have nothing, I have what is there? If you have wisdom, you enjoy the beautiful things around you, beautiful life. Like Louis Armstrong says, what a wonderful world. <laughs> huh? Jimmy, agree, disagree? Such a liar. <laughs> okay, you got that? It's, it's natural to enjoy it because you appreciate it more. It's not perfectly natural. But just because you enjoy it, don't react to it. That's all. Enjoying is natural. For me, pizza with honey is not natural. <laughs> For example. But I stop there. I don't complain. I give it to me. I still eat it. And then I pray. But then I pray. I should make a face. <laughs> Never mind. You see that? Alex's problem is that as soon as he discovers some new experiences, so, wow, I like this. It's so fascinating. You know what? If I, if I could uh, experience more of this, I think I will be so much happier than before. I think this is what I would define happiness in life, you know? Maybe I don't won't look for a job anymore. But how am I going to raise my child? So on and on and on and on. The enjoyment, my friend, is natural. Enjoy it, but stop. That's all. Don't think so much. I have disciples. I, don't know, I hate to tell you this. I know I'm going to lose some disciples who are very sincere. They kept on. They keep on texting me about their new sinta insights they have. Master, when you said today's about lecture, I think it's about me. <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> you know how many disciples I have? I was thinking of you. 
excuse me? <laughs> I have 20 disciples. I was thinking of you. <laughs> yes, eight. So, Master, I have a question. The one that you're describing here that uh, you see like sunset you enjoy. Yeah. Is that a thought or nothing to do with a thought? No, it's just a natural response. Our sensors. I don't know about you, like when you lie there on a massage table and the masseur go, you say, I feel nothing. <laughs> I say, uh, yeah, yeah. Every time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's the thought. It's natural. There's natural response to the stimuli. You're still alive, aren't you? <laughs> okay? So, and to enjoy yourself, to enjoy a good meal, to enjoy a company, to enjoy someone praising you. You say, oh, you look so young. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? No! <laughs> Why is it no, not okay to say thank you? Yes, DMT. Now he has no nickname. Because uh, you shouldn't react to praise or defamement. Because like Catholics. The Catholics, he said, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. <laughs> if someone gives me, okay, let's be generous, $500. Cold cash. Okay? I'd be happy. <laughs> Let's be real, okay? <laughs> I don't know about you, 500 will make me move. I say, oh, this is nice. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Alec would say, thank you. And, you know, Catholic would say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Right? Catholic? Speak up. <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> he disagrees. <laughs> okay? Because he thinks it's, it's uh, God who provided for him, who gave it to him. Right? So he says, thank you, Lord. That's natural, right? That's what they taught. What do we teach you to do? Nothing. <laughs> Look, this woman is shocked. <laughs> what about <laughs> politeness? Yes. Yeah, what about manners? Don't you have any manners? <laughs> what is what about what, what civilization? Are we supposed to say thank you? How about the magic word? Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Thank you. Huh? Yeah, thank you. But why won't we want to say thank you? Because that's a thought that says thank you. That would be no thought, not no thought. Got it? That's why when I get $500, someone give me $500, inside I'm happy. Oh, wow. <laughs> Outside, what do I do? I'm cool as a cucumber. <laughs> Got it? I don't say thank you, Lord. Oh, finally. <laughs> Someone appreciates me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> oh, 
I hope it's 500. <laughs> if 400 is not enough. Wow! <laughs> 600! I mean... <laughs> that's all? <laughs> is that all okay? No! <laughs> That's why you to say, inside you say, is that all? <laughs> but what do you do? You don't say anything. <laughs> that's no thought. And that's what Catholic's problem is. Something good happens to him, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For us, we don't say anything. We're cool as a cucumber. That's the difference between us and you. Got it? Unless you understand that, my friend, your girlfriend will never fall in love with you. <laughs> I hit where it hurts. <laughs> His girlfriend is Buddhist, by the way. He's Catholic and she's Buddhist. Christian, sorry. Christian. Catholic is okay, Catholic. Okay, got that? Okay, mm. that's thought there. Okay. Third bullet, true suchness is a substance of thought and thought is a function of true suchness. That's new topic. He'll elaborate next. Okay, don't ask. Not yet. <laughs> Next, 85. See, five more slides. Maybe we'll finish it today. The true suchness self-nature gives rise to thought. It is not the eye, ear, nose, or tongue that can think. The true suchness possesses a nature and therefore gives rise to thought. 真如自信起念, Okay, this is why, oh, well, let me put this away first. <laughs> okay. I don't try to explain to you, true sense is a substance of thought, thought is a function of true suchness. It's too complicated for you. Okay, uh, if you enlighten, I can explain it to you just like that. But since you're not, that's not even try. <laughs> Let's get, get to a low level, you understand this, and then it will help you understand later what this means, substance and function and so forth. Okay? That's why I, I beg for your patience. Okay? Let's talk about this section first. He says, true sensitivity is your Buddha nature. Okay? Whatever it is, something called Buddha nature that you have, we all have. All of us have, by the way. Not just me. All of you. Okay? Including the baby there. Okay? The true sense of self-nature, same, same meaning, same word. Okay? So different names, depending on, on your persuasion, is like uh, 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 Chinese versus uh, uh, Polish language and so forth. It is, it's whatever they call it, it's the same, refers to the same thing. Gives rise to thought. That's how thoughts are produced. They are produced from our nature. That's all you need to remember. Okay? Okay. It is not the eye, ears, nose, or tongue that can think. Meaning that, meaning that you think that the fact that you can hear, uh, you can hear, it's because from your thoughts? No, it's not. The hearing originates from your self-nature. Your tastes originated from your self-nature. Your eye, the fact you can perceive colors, you can perceive forms, actually is, originates from your self-nature. This is what scientists will never be able to prove. 
The only way for you to find out is when you become enlightened. Then you know what it means. So far, so good. So don't try to understand. All you have to do is memorize this. Okay? It's not something that can be demonstrated. Where are you going to find the self-nature? How are you going to measure it? How are you going to describe it? You can't. That's why you have to experience it. This is what, what people who are enlightened experience. And, and that's how, that's the only way for you to know what he's talking about. It cannot be explained. Either you know or you don't know. That's all. It's no in between. In order for you to know, you have to be enlightened. You become enlightened and you realize that your ears, your eyes, nose, and tongue, and your mind, actually they function because of your self-nature, of a Buddha nature. That's how marvelous you are. That's why we go, Mwah! It's because you're so special. You are, don't realize that you, your self-nature is so beautiful, so complete, so wonderful. Okay? Same thing. True suchness is what produces thoughts, not your mind. Hold your horses. Don't ask me now. Okay? You don't know what to ask. Therefore, whatever you ask is stupid. It doesn't make sense. Alex is chuckling. <laughs> He's stopping cold, topping me cold turkey. Don't ask. Eh? No? Okay. Uh, that's what he's referring to here. Substance of thought and function of two such, suchness. Okay. Substance of thought. Thought actually is part of your Buddha nature. You can think because your Buddha nature produces thought. And why do you think? Why are you producing thought? Because your Buddha nature says, let me design a building. And that's when you start thinking about how to design a building. It came from a Buddha nature first. Then, Next level is your thinking mind takes over and says, well, let me see how big it's going to be, hmm? and so forth. My training, what does my training tell me? Yes? That's where, at two levels, let me explain to you. At the self-nature level, it produces a thought. And then your thinking mind takes over and fills in the details so that you can explain to your colleague, to others, especially your client. Can you imagine yourself as an architect who goes to the client and says, you know, you know what I mean. My Buddha nature isn't yours. We talk the same language. He says, am I paying for that? If I, if I, am I paying you uh, for the design that I want, can I see something? You can, if, if you, you show me nothing, I don't have to pay for it, do I? Got that? Okay, so that's why the substance is nothing. At the lower level, it's just the Buddha nature at work. It's supposed to do, it can do that. And at the shallow level, ordinary life level, we produce drawing, we produce explanation, we produce equation. We, the engineer uh, gives you uh, the certification that the, the, the structure is structurally sound, okay, and so forth. So at the worldly level, we have all these structures, these buildings, that's called function. Am I making sense to you? Yes, seven. Master, so the, um, 
whether it's the Mona Lisa or if it's the Empire State Building, yes, that's, that's like Buddha nature, or is that more the consciousness, eighth consciousness? What happened? It's a good question. Suppose uh, Leonardo da Vinci, when he, he uh, did uh, the Mona Lisa, the painting there, how did it happen? The thought says, I want to paint. That's from the Buddha nature. I'm going to produce, I'm going to create. Okay? Then the thought takes over. Shallow level, I'm going to create. I want to create. Then the thoughts take over and says, going to be about the woman I'm in love with. I'm going to immortalize her. Let's see. Okay? Let's not make it too obvious. Like the American who put, you know, hearts and hearts and hearts all over. <laughs> we, I'm going to make her so that she smiles at me very discreetly. That unless you pay attention, you won't notice that she's actually smiling at me. I like her. So it's just me and her. She only smiles at me. See that? That's thought. You see that? Down there is I want to create. How does it, does it help? Okay. Yes, go forest. So, Master, to clarify, the thoughts here includes um, non-dual thoughts too, right? It's, it's all thoughts. Non what? Of nature. Includes non-dual thoughts. So oh, what thought? Non dual. 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 Non dual. dual. Non dual thoughts? <laughs> non dual thoughts. Non dual thought. <laughs> dual. <laughs> non dual. dual. Oh, excuse me. I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> yeah, it's non dual thought. Let me simplify it for you. You at when you think as the two different levels. First of all, your Buddha nature can think. It's called true thought. Let's be clear here. Let's see. Can we go with this? I don't want to finish this. I don't want to come back to this world again. I mean, uh, this text again. <laughs> 85. The true sense of same nature gives rise to thought. It's not the ear. Okay, I think we're done with that. Okay. Uh, 87, we have three more slides only. Without true suchness, the eye, ear forms and sounds immediately go bad. Okay, so he says, all your sensory organs, they operate because of the support of the Buddha nature. So far, so good. That's why as long you can think, as long you can hear, you have the Buddha nature inside of you. That's why you're so special. I'm not kissing you. I'm kissing your Buddha nature. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> People say, the queen is so happy. Oh, master likes me. No, I like their Buddha natures. <laughs> Wait, it looks good. Though. <laughs> okay, got that? And so, uh, without the true suchness, the eyes cannot see, the ear cannot hear, the forms cannot, can, uh, the form and sound uh, will, will no longer uh, register, be registered. Okay? That finishes. Good no advisors, the true suchness self-nature gives rise to thought. And the six faculties, although they see, hear, feel, and know, are not defiled by the 10,000 states. The true nature is always independent. Very good. That's the very last slide here. He says, so let me explain it to you. Your Buddha nature can think. So far so good, has a thought that arises. 
That's a function of Buddha nature. Buddha nature doesn't sit there. Your nature doesn't sit there and say, oh, I'm going to be happy. Your nature is very busy. He says, I need to take care of my children. I need to, to, to uh, save the world. I need to... So, so it's naturally, the Buddha nature is doing something meaningful, if you will. It's always meaningful. So far, so good? That's you. First, let's talk at the mind level. It produces a thought. It's called a true thought from your Buddha nature. So far, so good? That's a peer level. Now comes a worldly level. Then your conscious mind fills in the blanks. It says, let's do yellow. Let's do this particular form. Let's call this engineer and so forth. Okay? Uh, so the conscious mind takes over and fills in the worldly details, if you will. That's how you operate. You operate right now, you're thinking and you think it's, it's you. Actually, your thinking there is at the superficial level, your thinking mind. You don't realize that behind the thinking mind is the true mind, if you will. So the true mind, the inside thinking mind, is in front. Okay, you talk to each other, okay? You talking, you're communicating through your thinking mind. Yes? That's how you understand each other. Can you imagine two people talking with two mind, the two mind? What is that? It ain't going to happen. <laughs> Two mind don't need to talk. <laughs> this is like someone telling me, I love you. I say, I know. <laughs> If you really love me, you don't need to tell me. I know already. But because we don't know, that's why we need to keep on telling. We keep on asking our loved one, do you love me? Do you really love me? Say it more often. Because you're not sure, right? And the other person is not sure they know either. <laughs> That's why it's total confusion. You're confused, and Malcolm is confused. That's why you expect him to say, I love you, I love you, I adore you, I respect you, I revere you. <laughs> Your Buddha nature loves me, I know that. He says, you who don't love me, that I know. <laughs> you got that? Okay, so that's two different levels. And I have ten, nine more minutes, and then I, uh, let me finish this, and I'll feel your questions, okay? That's stick to nine minutes, okay? Shall we? Yeah. Uh, it's Saturday afternoon. I have better things to do and hang out here with you, okay? So, <laughs> okay, so, so what happens is that, is that ordinary people, they only see the thinking mind. They're dependent on the thinking mind. What about sages? They don't have the same restrictions. They can function without the thinking mind. They can go through this thinking mind. And they can connect with us. So they can say, I love you, but they don't mean it completely at all. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's a different kind of mode for the sages. Whereas for us, we are stuck at the thinking mind. Okay? That's why we need reinforcements. That's why we uh, daydream and so forth. Yes, go forth. Uh, uh, so my previous question, I didn't finish. I was going to ask the... Um, for non-wholesome thoughts, like um, 
you got a check of five hundred dollars, and you thought of, is that all? The, what is the self nature thought? The level of thought at the self nature level is behind that thought. I don't understand the question. So, so for the, so. If all the thoughts are coming from the self nature, what uh, what is the thought for non wholesome? What is the self nature thought for some of the non wholesome thoughts? And then I gave an example of. I don't understand. Uh, so you have a reaction. You we have a thought of getting a check and then the thought is this is not enough what is the self nature doing in terms of arising give a rise to that thought you know what the questions mean she's not know. enlightened moving on next that's obvious <laughs> become enlightened and you know what I'm talking about yes in the back master we still have two more slides would you like to finish that Two more slides. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm going to finish that. Thank you. Any questions before I go to the next? Uh, quickly, yes, nine. From Lyo, the true suchness is totality. It includes everything as Master explained. Then does it also include the ego? So true suchness is not opposite of ego. Can I understand the true suchness like this? Yes. Next, yes. From Samson Lao, how could we begin to train ourselves to think with our Buddha nature? What does one need to be enlightened to do so? Yes, do chan as a fast, quickest way to, uh, to function, to get there. Next, four. Uh, true suchness seems so superior to what we currently have now. What drives us to continue in our ways and not just do true suchness. You have it now already. You just don't know how to use it. It's behind you. It's just your thinking mind takes over. He wants to know right away. So, true suchness doesn't want anything. Doesn't want a red card. Doesn't want, <laughs> doesn't want to know. Doesn't want to make sense. It's your thinking mind says, this doesn't make sense to me. Yes, go for us. Master, does um, true suchness just act spontaneously? Or does the, like an enlightened person kind of have some influence like to not have an unwholesome thought, I guess? Spontaneous, if that's how it is. Okay, that's, that's a problem when I try to explain too much to you. And then you want to know more, which I cannot explain to you. All I can tell you is that, is that you have to be there. It's not it can, something that I cannot make sense to you. It doesn't matter how much I tell you. It will never make sense to you. All I can tell you is that what I just told you, be aware of it. That's all. There's something marvelous inside of you called self-nature and the Buddha nature. And you practice Chan, you get there. And you know what I mean. That's the only way. There's no way to explain to you. All I can do is dangle a carrot in front of you and say, go there, go there, go there, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then you know, you, know, you get it. Okay? 91. Therefore, the Vimala Kirti Sutra says, if one is well able to discriminate all Dharma marks, then in primary meaning, one does not move. Okay, uh, and this is, it sounds simple, but it's not the way you think. Uh, it says, if you're able to discriminate all Dharma marks, what does it mean, discriminate all Dharma marks? If you're able to see and perceive anything out there in the world, that's all Dharma marks. All Dharma meaning anything. Marks the characteristics. It's round. It's black. It's uh, it's uh, stings. It's precious, uh, and so forth. It's uh, yellow. Uh, 
uh, is desirable. All everything that you can put a word to describe it is called a mark. Okay. Any characteristic is called a mark. All dharma meaning anything, anything that can has characteristics meaning everything in the world. Okay. So far, so good. All dharma marks it meanings. Everything in this universe, everything, satellites, galaxies, Hubble scope, telescope, Putin, Petit Macron, I mean, short Macron, Petit is French for diminutive. <laughs> I don't think I should go to France next week. Anyway, so if you're able to perceive things in this universe, okay, that's what it means, discriminate all Dharma marks, then in a primary meaning, one does not move. Then fundamentally, in essence, one does not move. What does it mean, one does not move? You don't think. Move here is a special terminology for the Buddhist. Move here means to think. Your mind moves. When your mind moves, that's how you think. You think is because your mind moves. Chan meditation will help you not move your mind. In Chan skills give you the choice. Right now, you don't have a choice. As soon as someone insults you, you're talking to me? Right? Your mind moves immediately. Right? Uh, that's why it's called, it's called mind moves. You give rise to thought of anger, thought of desire. Yes, I'd love to have a Red Ferrari or white Porsche, if you cannot afford it. I settle for Panamera. Red is Ferrari, white is Panamera. It's a little bit less expensive. Anyway, you are poor. I, I rest my case. You don't. Pa, 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 pana what? Pana what? <laughs> Ferrari, I know, but pana, 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 pana something? <laughs> Can you repeat, please? <sighs> yes. Oh, Master, just want to bring to your attention that we skipped slide 89. 89? We don't care. Okay. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> we have, don't have any time. Don't, let's not be stuck on technicalities. <laughs> let's not move, okay? I skip one slide, so what? <laughs> okay. Uh, I get to 92. Okay? So, one does not move. Remember, this is a much more important concept. Don't move. Don't think. Okay? So now you understand today, from now on, when you hear the word, the mind moves, means you don't, that means that you think. You give rise to a thought. You move, your mind moves, you move. So the Chinese says, xin tung, move. There's movement, the thought arises. Okay? Hmm. So here Vimalakirti Sutra says, if you're able to discern things, anything out there, uh, then actually your mind does not move. What does it mean? You see, this is why no one really understands and knows how to explain this because it cannot be explained. <laughs> okay? Basically, it says, it says fundamentally, 
you're, a bil- you're able to perceive, to hear, to feel, you know, to taste. Okay? It's from yourself nature. Okay? It's not because your thinking mind is processing it. Not at all. This does not move here. There's no thinking mind. The mind, one does not move here, is the thinking mind is not at work. It's your Buddha nature that you can feel, who can see, who can hear. That's what actually happens. It's not your mind. See, in the uh, ordinary people, they say it's the ears who brings in the sound, yes? To the mind. It is the eye who brings in an object, an image to the mind that processes it. It says, well, let me see. It looks like a deep fake of Donald Trump. You know what I mean? So all the five sense organs, this, the form brings the form, the sound, the, the feel, okay? uh, the smell, and the taste, they're all brought to the mind. Who then processes it? He says, Well, this seems like lavender. It's not purple. You see? So the mind, your model is that everything has to go back to the mind, right? The mind processes it. In fact, what the Vimala Kirti Sutra is saying, actually what you don't know is that you can function without that thinking mind of yours. You can not use it, and yet you can know right away it's lavender. You know right away it's yellow. You know right away it's stinking tofu. Your mind, your true mind can function without the thinking mind. There are two minds here. The true mind, that's the self-nature, and the false mind, the thinking mind. And the think, so if you're able to do that, it's because it's your true mind that actually at work, not the thinking mind that ordinary people are so proud of and so dependent upon people like DMT. He says, let me see if I understand it here. Okay? Am I making sense to you? If you don't understand, it's okay. Yes, sir. Master, does the, the thoughts of the thinking mind uh, ultimately coming from the true mind as well, or is it so, somehow separate? Once you get the thinking mind going, it takes over. The true mind does not need the thinking mind at all. Okay? Anyone else? That's why, for example, in a Chan, give an example what in the Chan school, uh, Friday night, we explain the, the uh, Wei Yang anecdotes where Master Wei Shan says, Hey, Yang Shan, say something. And Yang Shan says, okay. That's it. You're not impressed? I rest my case. <laughs> you see, you don't understand at all. He said, okay, without thinking. And you say, and? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Typical confused people. You see? So Wei Shan says, say something. Yang Shan says, okay. And you say, what else? He said, okay, with his true mind. Whereas if you ask TMT in the back, 
Say something. You know what he says? Let me think. <laughs> Let me think. Or you say something. I don't know. What would you like me to say? Got it? Hmm? That's a thinking mind. The true mind, we can function without thinking. It knows. It can hear. It look at you and say, ah, you like me. Ah, she hates me. Ah, you know, like, I know that's like instinct. You girls, you know, he likes me. Sounds familiar? Huh? He's interested in me. Men will never understand it. <laughs> Men would never realize you are so sensitive. We look at you and say, Ooh, I don't like you. <laughs> don't get close to me. <laughs> no, I'm not going to have coffee with you. You tell yourself, okay? But I'm not going to offend you either. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay? So what women call instincts actually quite often is the true mind in action that knows, that can understand, that can perceive so fast without thinking. And then after that yellow uh, T-shirt, he would say, I know he likes me because... Because he will look at me without blinking for five minutes. <laughs> That's not normal. <laughs> normal men would not ever do that. Okay? You see what I mean? So the thinking mind takes over. The instinct says, he likes me. And you know, the thinking mind, yeah, I agree. You see? That's how it works. The instinct says, yeah, I know. And the thing my fills in the detail, fills in the blanks. Yes, Catholic, quickly. So does that mean women use the true mind more often? Excuse me? So does that mean that the women use their true mind more often? Buddhist women in particular. <laughs> when Catholics approach us, our women, they use the true mind immediately. This Catholic is phony. <laughs> Ask your girlfriend, she'll tell you. That's why un unless you become Buddhist, you'll never be able to breach our defenses. <laughs> okay, everyone, too much jesting, too much joking around. We stop here today. Thank you all. We finish with chapter four. Thank you all, and uh, we see you. Next time. Forget it. JMT, quick one, quickly, quickly. Oh, de, tuliseyo. Yeah, we can hear you. 네, 그러니까 춘이 제가 하고 싶었던 질문을 했었는데 제가 다시 바꿔 질문하면 상욱 여기부터 빨리 먼저 해주세요. 기, 먼저 조금 길어. 들리세요? 상욱 스님 소리가 안 들려요? 음, 다시 바꿔 질문하면 그러니까 인연 자성에서 생각이 일어났고 그 후에 각자의 레벨에 따라 즉 관심사에 따라서 어, 왜곡하고 굴절시킨다고 이해하면 될까요? 다시요? 상욱 스님 통역이 안 들립니다. Sir, I wanna um, 
I want to check whether my, my understanding is right or not. Uh, so what I understand is that the thought arises in the Buddha nature, mm -hmm. and then depending on our interest in, and depending on our level, so we, uh, we understand differently. Is it right? No. 